All right, let's, uh, thank you. Let me, let me pray for us and we'll jump back into this. And Dearly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your kindness. Lord, help us not to take times like this for granted where we get to come together with other believers and, and think through your word, Lord. It is more than we deserve. I pray that you would help us to, uh, to not only think deeply through your word right now, but Lord, that it be a practice that we, uh, we incorporate into our lives forever. We thank you, we love you, we praise you, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> before I jump in, I, I'm trying to slow down. I apologize if I'm, if I'm talking too fast. That's how I normally preach. So I think our, I think our church is a little bit used to it, um, but someone at another church reminded me that, that not everyone is, because I, I was preaching in Alabama, right? And I had like a ton of material. And um, I think they were trying to have me cover both marriage and parenting in one. And so I'm like, I was really moving. And after the first session, one of the elders came up to me and said, Pastor Kim, we not only talk slow, we listen slow. <laughs> so like, so then I go, oh man, now I gotta really slow down and cut things out. But we're in Southern California, so let's, we'll just keep going. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians chapter three. Now, hopefully the previous session at least provides a general framework through which to think through your life, specifically sin and suffering. But let's be honest, just because you know something doesn't always solve every problem. Like, have you ever just felt stuck, where it almost seems like, like the Bible's not even helping? And by that, I don't mean that we would actually question the sufficiency of Scripture, but for honest, there are times where practically it doesn't seem to be working. So you study the Bible, you, you try to know the truth, and yet at the end of the day, it seems like you're going nowhere. Right? I, I've seen this time and time and again. It's, it's the young man mired in pornography who fails on a weekly basis, or the mom that so easily becomes angry with her children and just can't seem to overcome her temper, or that cold and distant marriage that seems to lack any love. And often there seems to be just so little traction, even if the people seemingly know the Bible. And this isn't just members of the church. I've counseled other leaders and other counselors, other pastors, and they've struggled with the same thing. And yet, all of that isn't how I'm most familiar with the problem. I, I know this is a challenge because I've seen this struggle in my own life. I think of particular sins that I, as a pastor and biblical counselor, no less, still struggle to find victory over, even though I have plenty of truth. Or I just, I think of seasons of suffering where God's word just kind of sounded hollow in my heart, even though my life and even my occupation rest on the conviction that the word is necessary and sufficient and powerful. And so this is you, you're not alone, but that all being said, my encouragement isn't simply it's hard for everyone, we've all been there, what I think is encouraging is that the solution is maybe more practical than we realize. Because while there's different reasons why the, world, why the word might not seemingly work, a, a lack of genuine salvation, lack of repentance, hidden sin, in my life, in the life of those we counsel, I've noticed two common reasons um, that the word does not accomplish what we know it can. One is that they're not connecting the truth to everyday life, and second, they're not going to that truth in everyday life. So on one hand, we struggle to see how a particular truth really matters in the day-to-day -day difficulties of life. So, for example, you might think, okay, it's great that God loves me, but how is that helping me when I'm in, in constant physical pain? Or on the other hand, we, even if we know how a truth matters to our lives, so often we don't really embrace and live out that truth in the middle of sin and suffering. So, for example, some trial comes up and we quickly go to Google before we go to God. Now, by looking at the title of this message, you can, kind of, I mean, you can kind of guess where this is headed and the solution I'm going to offer. Of course, we're going to talk about how to meditate on the Word of God. But this is because, as we'll see, meditation solves that problem I just mentioned. It helps make the connection between the truth and everyday life and helps us to go to that truth in everyday life. So let's look at our passage, it, it, or our verse. It comes right before Paul will teach on, on the, to the Colossians on how to change. So this is really, whatever he says here is, is going to be foundational to our sanctification. So just one verse, Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So if we're going to put off sin and put on love and be ruled by peace, all the things he's going to talk about, we must set our mind on the things above. We must meditate. Now this topic is close to my heart because it's been really life-changing. For me, I can honestly say that it's been one of the most important aspects of my walk over the last 10 years. And yet realize, I'm not who you might think of when you think of a person who really is able to meditate on God's word. I'm not overly contemplative or well-focused or someone with hours to just think about life. I, no, I, I have a short attention span. I'm constantly busy. I'm bored easily. I like comfort. I often prefer to keep things superficial. And yet despite all that, God has been so very kind to me through meditating on his word. And my point is, if I can do it, just about anyone can. 
Now this all being said, even if you think that hypothetically meditation seems like it should be helpful, the difficulty is that it seems to many to be vague, a fuzzy, even eth ethereal. Like if I said, okay, your assignment this week is just to spend 10 minutes every day meditating. I think for many, you wouldn't even know where to start. And, and I know that feeling. Even after graduating seminary, if you'd asked me to teach you to meditate, I, I think I would've been fairly lost. But understand that meditation is most simply the idea of thinking deeply about something. With Christian meditation being the idea of thinking deeply about biblical truth. And the purpose of it is to see life with greater clarity and to grow in love and faith in Christ. So we'll, we'll dive into what meditation looks like as practically as possible in a moment. But for now, to better understand it, let me illustrate it this way. Think of meditation as fuel for the fire in our hearts. Right? At the beginning of the year, uh, uh, Pastor Mark spoke on, the idea, uh, on that idea from Psalm 111. Remember, he was, he was kind of telling the story about he lived in a home where you actually had to have a fire going to keep warm. And the idea was we need to fuel uh, the fire, right? In the same way he talked about fueling our faith. Right? So, so to expand on that idea, realize that fuel grows the fire, and it does two things. It brings light, and it brings heat. Okay? By light, I mean it offers clarity in a world that's made dark and distorted by sin. And by heat, I mean that it warms our affections for Christ by growing our faith, love, and worship for him. And that's what we want, right? We want to see the world rightly, and we want to worship our Savior rightly. Now, okay, it may still sound vague, but be patient, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Now, one, one quick thing before we continue. The Puritans would make the distinction between occasional meditation, that's meditation triggered by something like a sunset or eating a good meal, like I'm just gonna, that moves me to meditate, and deliberate meditation, like set aside time to meditate, like your quiet time, that's what I'm gonna meditate. These are very, very helpful. But what we're gonna focus on is what I'm gonna call situational meditation. It's a meditation that's in response to some situation, namely suffering or temptation. <coughs> And it's meant to guard our hearts against idolatry and encourage our faith in Christ. So when you think of meditation, don't just simply think about like, I'm gonna sit down in my quiet time and meditate. Think about it like something's happening and I need to go to the word of God in that moment. So first idea is this, guarding our hearts. Meditation isn't missing, it is misdirected. Guarding our hearts. Meditation isn't missing, it's misdirected. For me, when things are difficult, I'm tempted to let my wine wander. Right, I'll share more about this later, but a couple of summers ago, I had open heart surgery to repair a heart defect that I was born with. And it was a really difficult recovery, okay? So uh, various complications, but one of them was my sternum didn't fuse. So for over a year, I wasn't allowed to carry anything more than five pounds. Um, so imagine this, so my wife had to do so much. So for example, we went on a trip and it just looked so bad because I can't carry any bags. So we're going through the airport. She has a heavy backpack on. She has two bags, and I had a fanny pack, right? And in my defense, it's like a good-sized fanny pack, like wallet, chapstick, but it just looks horrible. And then, of course, we get on the plane, and this petite lady looks at me, and she says, can you help me put my bag up? And my wife says, I can do it, right? And then it looks really bad, because then I'm like, I'm like stepping aside so my wife can, can do it. My wife is not nearly as tall as me. But with things like that, with health problems, with those kind of struggles, I'm so tempted to let my mind wander, and it shows the danger of meditation. Now, you might be thinking, well, danger of meditation. I thought meditation was a good thing, but remember what we said. Meditation, at its simplest, is thinking deeply about something, which means we all meditate. However, we don't always meditate on the Word. We meditate on the sins of our spouse, on hopes of occupational achievement, on lustful images, on the failures of our coworkers and ministry partners, on politics, on the opinions of our peers, on our appearance, on the dreams of hitting that wedding shot, on the tech gadget or pair of shoes we want to buy. We all meditate. And what this means is that one of the greatest challenges of meditation is not that it is missing, but that it's misdirected. Let me read you Colossians 3.2 again. He says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So again, so contextually, as you may know, like many of Paul's letters, he's made that transition from the realities of the gospel to how the gospel works itself out in everyday life. And this is the beginning of that section on sanctification, the process of change, of becoming more like Christ. And so he's about to say things like, put to death what is earthly in you, and above all the things put on love, and be ruled by peace. And yet before all of that, he says this, set your mind on things above. And this idea of set your mind in the original language is an ongoing action. It's not like a one time. It's meant to describe life. And so this is the picture of meditation, to continually set your mind on the things of Christ. Now, importantly, 
Paul doesn't end there. He doesn't say, set your mind on things above, period, end of sentence. He says, set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. So do you kind of see the contrast? We're going to set our mind somewhere. By that, he means we'll, we'll meditate. We'll, we'll direct our focus and our affections, our faith and our worship. And really, there's only two options, the things above or the things below. As Paul wrote in Romans 1, our heart moves towards the creation or the creator. And this is important because it brings meditation into the realm of everyday life. Because the question now changes from, are you meditating, to, what are you meditating on? Trust that the problem isn't that you aren't meditating. Likely, you're spending hours meditating every week. Again, the question really is, what are you meditating on? And that's why meditation has the potential to be dangerous, because we meditate on the wrong things. And understand, this is devastating to our walks. Paul points this out. Look at the tie-in with verse 5 in Colossians, in Colossians chapter 3. So verse 2, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Verse 5, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual morality, impurity, etc. So do you see the connection? Do not set your mind on things on earth. Put to death what is earthly in you. So what is Paul saying? If we want to put to death what is earthly, we can't set our mind on the things of earth. All right, you really can be more clear. So imagine we do set our mind on things on earth. We meditate on the things on earth. What should we expect? That we wouldn't put to death what is earthly in us. Rather, we would give life to what is earthly in us. We would strengthen and grow things like impurity, evil desire, anger, slander, all of it. Do you see the picture? I mean, think of it this way. Our idols, they're dead. They're powerless. Psalm 115, 5 and 6 says, They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. As we look at in the last message to Christians, they're supposed to be dead to us. What then is the problem? We give life to our idols. How? Through meditation. Again, as we think of Colossians, when we set our mind on things above, we put to death what is earthly in us. When we set our mind on things of earth, we give them life. So as we meditate on what we want from others, on things like that, we perform spiritual CPR and resurrect our idols. It's almost like they're zombies, right? Still dead, but animated and bent on destruction. And in giving them life, we also give them power. To picture this better, let's return to the illustration I mentioned at the beginning. I mentioned that meditation is fuel for the fire of our hearts. But the way we actually illustrate it in our counseling class is this. Imagine in your heart there are two fires. One is the fire of your worship and faith in Christ. The other is the fire of your worship and faith to your idols. The question is, which one will you pour fuel on? Right, most of us have been camping, and you have to make a fire, but what determines the power and the, the longevity of the power is, is if you put fuel on it and how much. The same is true for the fire of our worship. So for instance, if someone spends hours mindlessly surfing the internet or, or taking in social media, or they dwell often on the sins and faults of others, or if they listen to the culture's ideas of happiness and rights and values, or if they constantly look in envy at what others have, they're meditating on the things of this world. They are pouring fuel on the flames of their idolatry, and it becomes this raging fire that consumes their lives. On the other hand, if they were to focus on the truths of who God is, his character, what he's done for us in Christ, his promises to us, if they go through the word and let the word go through them, if they focus on the beauty of Christ or the beauty of their idols, if they come back to the gospel every day, then they're pouring fuel on the flames of their faith and love of Christ so that it becomes a raging fire that consumes their lives. This is why what we meditate on so easily shapes our hearts. One way or the other, we are fueling our faith and our worship. And this again highlights the danger. If I'm pouring fuel on the fire of my idolatry, it grows, and simultaneously the fire of my faith and worship of Christ dims and grows cold. Now, when we consider the need for truth, we often think of things like, well, personal devotions, Sunday sermons, maybe small groups or even counseling, and these are obviously hugely important, But if that is all that's needed, why isn't that enough? I mean, if we're taking time in the Word, why do we still get stuck? Maybe to make it more personal, why why do you sometimes get stuck? Why is pride still an issue, or anger, or envy, or lust, or lack of compassion, or lack of generosity? Obviously, it's not a problem with the Word, right? The Word is completely sufficient. The problem, then, is the sufficient Word is not sufficiently a part of our lives. It occupies small moments of thought, but it's nowhere to be found during significant moments of the rest of our day. But notice what the Colossians passage doesn't say. Set your mind on things above for 50 minutes on Sunday when you hear a sermon and during small groups and and 20 minutes every day during your quiet time, and then the rest of the day, you can set your mind on whatever you want. 
The picture is to constantly set our mind on things above and constantly fight not to set our mind on the things of earth. And what this means is that someone's intake of the word is limited to small Sunday mornings, small group and counseling, and quiet times that actually isn't enough. I mean, usually we think, well, that person is knocking out of the park. I mean, they're going to church, they're going to small group, maybe they're getting counseling, they're doing quiet times every day. But really, it's basic spiritual math. If we set our mind on the things above for a total of a few hours a week, and the rest of the week we set our mind on things of earth, what's going to win that battle? Maybe you could put it this way, even more bluntly. If we think small groups and quiet times and an hour and a half service on Sunday that makes our God known will counter seven days of our culture making its God, God's known, we're fooling ourselves. Because while we have set aside the Lord's day for worship, the idols of our world have realized that it's much more effective to, to concede Sunday mornings if they can have the rest of the week to encourage, encourage worship at its altars. And honestly, the evangelism is relentless. Because remember, the idols of the world, they have their own pastors preaching a gospel of worldly hope and their own version of salvation. And importantly and scarily, their worship services are going on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So for example, the man or woman struggling with lust, it's not just that they occasionally think about or look at sinful images. <coughs> Rather, our culture is constantly placing before them temptation. The world preaches the importance of personal happiness, and selfishness is encouraged. It makes the sexualization of men and women the air that we breathe. Sin is actually celebrated. Image after image is thrown at them until things like modesty and marital fidelity and covenantal love are rare realities. And so understand, as that person walks into church on a Sunday morning ready for that 15-minute sermon, they have likely already had a whole week of preaching. Whether through advertisements on TV, social media posts, articles on their feed, the way their coworkers or classmates talk and dress, they've heard sermon after sermon encouraging them to pursue their lust, to be happy, and to be satisfied. And so while a quiet time and a Sunday sermon in small groups um, are important, I'm sorry, so while they may do a 20-minute personal devotion, trust me, they will spend much more devoted time to filling their hearts with the things of this world. But do you see the picture? This is not just about someone who struggles with lust. This is about someone whose worship has gone astray through the constant meditation on the things of this world. Meaning that whereas a Sunday sermon is very significant, it's actually insufficient. And if you you know us, you know how, how we hold highly the preaching of the word but my point isn't the word is insufficient. It's that, it's that a focus on the word must come from more than the pulpit or personal devotions. It must be a prevalent focus throughout the day. And this, I believe, is where meditation is so powerful. It brings God's truth into our hearts throughout the day. And on the flip side, I would say an absence of biblical Christ-centered meditation is so dangerous. Because understand, if we don't address misdirected meditation and pursue biblical meditation, we're leaving ourselves vulnerable to sin and idolatry, the world and the flesh. I mean, even as you think about how important a quiet time is, one of the reasons it's important is not because of, you know, that, whatever, 20, 30 minutes that you spend with God, but that that those truths would impact the rest of your day. Maybe think of it this way. A while back, I went to a mechanic, and I picked the cheapest one, which never turns out poorly. And they were supposed to pick my automatic door locks, and they actually made one worse. Like, it didn't lock at all. And then he said, okay, we need another part. It's going to take a week, but at least three of your doors lock. And this is where, like, the Holy Spirit, right? It's, it's keeping me, my sarcasm in check because I feel like I have to explain to the mechanic that while I know nothing about cars, I know that one unlocked door means my car is unlocked. I believe often, we, I, think, I believe we often think that if we're doing our quiet time and we lock that door and we, we go to small group or council and we lock that door and we go to church on Sunday morning, we lock that door, then we're safe from sin and idolatry. But it's like locking three doors, And the lack of meditation is leaving that last door unlocked. Because while we may be somewhat safe while we're in the Word in those times, we are allowing a lot of time when our hearts are vulnerable to the influence of the world. So again, we have to consider this issue of meditation. Now, the example of last might be fairly obvious, so let's use another one. Think about a man who struggles with anger and bitterness towards his wife. And of course, this could work vice versa. So imagine they fight often, it's become a cold marriage with little affection, and he thinks about, if he weren't a Christian, he would have divorced her a long time ago. <clears throat> now often, in these situations, if we were counseling them, we would be tempted to focus on what, do, what happens when they fight. So we give them teachings on things like anger, we might offer some conflict resolution skills, which can be very helpful. You might tell him, hey, next time you're tempted to yell, 
Consider how you might love your wife or think about the worship of your heart or repent or try to do what would honor God and it's all very good. But something I've seen is that the biggest problem isn't what they do when they're together, but what they do when they're apart. In other words, their anger, their conflict is often the result of what they've meditated on when they're apart. I mean, picture it. She makes a sarcastic and unkind comment about a mess he left in the bathroom and he begins his daily meditation. Why does she always speak to me like that? Like, after all, I do. I feel like my friends' wives, they never talk to them like that. That's probably why one of them told me I should get a divorce. She, she always talks to me like that. She never has anything nice to say. I can't believe I have to live the rest of my life with her. Now, that happening throughout the day, are we surprised that he's angry and bitter? We shouldn't be. Again, regardless of whether or not he did his quiet time in the morning or he went to church on Sunday, he has spent much more time pouring fuel on his idolatry. It's almost like he's doing personal devotions in bitterness. So like 15 minutes of personal devotion to God, two hours of personal devotion to his idols. I remember part, part of the point of a personal devotion is to pursue a deeper relationship, to grow in affection and love, to have hearts turned towards another. And that's happening just towards their idols. And with this deeper affection for his idols, he has moved towards greater anger, anger, anger and bitterness. Honestly, many times people have spent months and even years meditating on the sins and the failings of their spouse. And I think this at least in part explains why it's so difficult for people to overcome certain deeply rooted sins like bitterness or lust or discontentment because they have spent months and even years pouring fuel on their idolatry. To come back to our previous illustration, if you light a match, it's pretty easy to blow out. You light a match, throw it in the woods, throw some fuel on it, it becomes a forest fire, you guys know in Southern California, forest fires can take months to put out. Like right now, if you're struggling to love your spouse, I believe probably a big part of it is what you've meditated on for the last months and years. Now, there's so many other examples we could look at. Think of the misdirected meditation for someone struggling with discontentment in their singleness. Think about all the things they could be thinking about. Think of the misdirected meditation of someone struggling with stress at work. Think of the misdirected meditation for someone who's suffering with health issues, someone who has a wayward child, someone who's struggling with infertility, someone who hates what, they're, what they look like, someone who feels justified in their frustration with their kids. So let's consider the implications on this, of this. Going back to our fuel illustration, we should try to really consider how we're pouring fuel on the wrong fires in our hearts. And it offers two big questions. So light, how am I fueling an earthly worldview? And heat, how am I feeling a greater love and devotion for my idols? So just consider in your life, what is fueling your earthly worldview? Like, here are some questions to ask yourself. What are the unhelpful counselors in my life? What are the sources of information in my life? Am I spending more time reading the internet than I do the Bible? How are things like media and my newsfeed affecting my worldview? And second, consider your life. What is fueling a greater love and devotion to your idols? What do I, what do I feel I need to be happy what do I feel it has to change for me to be safe? What am I thinking about so much that, that my want has become a need? What am I looking more to than I look to God? The simple idea being, um, we must guard our hearts. I believe for some of you, your lives actually would be radically transformed very quickly if you would just guard your heart against misdirected meditation. One last illustration of this before we move on. I think social media is a good example of this idea of meditation, how we fuel our faith or idolatry. So I have no idea where any of you stand on this. And the neat thing is this, I'm just going to go home and your pastor's have to deal with it. And second, I'm not on social media. So even if you say I don't like that, I won't know. So there, there it is. Now, again, I'm not on social media, um, but I, I'm sorry, I'm not against social media. I was talking with a pastor a while back who I believe is using it really well. He's been nice, gracious, engaging biblical talk, topics. He invites accountability. He's willing to ask for forgiveness. He's using it to try to love God and love others. I, our church has an Instagram account. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I feel like I should know this. I'm pretty sure we have one. That being said, it can really be a source of fuel for sin and idolatry. Imagine the young woman who struggles with lust or body image. Imagine the older single who struggles with discontentment. Imagine the person who's easily angered by political discussion. Imagine the man having financial problems that struggles with envy. Social media provides a lot of fuel for the, the wrong kind of worship. I read that the average person is on social media for over two hours a day. If that's what they meditate on, are we surprised that they struggle? That's like a two-hour daily devotional focused on their idols. Now, again, I'm not on social media. Again, not because I believe it in and of itself it's sinful, like my wife does have Instagram, but I know it's not good for me. And by not being on social media, 
Uh, I've never been angry or jealous or judgmental because of something I've seen on social media, right? It's not really that complicated. I've never seen a political post from someone in our congregation. I have never seen pictures of some other church that seems to be doing way better than ours. I've never been tempted to look a little longer at someone's post who's, uh, who's not dressed modestly. I've never been inclined to post something that would make me look amazing. But understand, this is really important. I'm not on social media, not because I think it is sinful, but because I know that I am. I am not being falsely humble when I say the reason I've chosen not to be on social media for my life is not because I'm so godly, but because I am not godly enough. I guarantee I would be frustrated or even angry with what someone else would post. I know I'd be tempted or jealous of someone else's ministry or someone else's vacation. I know I'd be tempted to lust if certain pictures flashed across my screen. I would be tempted to be judgmental for any number of reasons. And I know, I mean, I mean I'm absolutely convinced that I would waste my time. Now, hopefully this is a non-issue for you. Again, I would never know. <clears throat> but I would say this, if it's stopping you from setting your mind on things above, if it's encouraging your idolatry in any way, then you, need to, you might need to think about whether or not you remove that dangerous fuel. Now, with all that in place, understand it's not enough to refuse to set our mind on things above. We have to set our mind, I mean, refuse to set our mind on things of earth. We have to set our mind on things above. And that leads to the second point there. Going after Christ. Meditation isn't nice. It is necessary. As you're going through life, where do you turn for answers? Like, if you got a bad medical diagnosis, where would you go? Most likely, you would go to Google, right? There seems to be a plethora of knowledge on the web. In fact, I found a little while back that Google even has answers that the Bible doesn't. Like, my son was, uh, had a project on Zacchaeus for school, and I can't help him with a lot of homework like math. Oh, that's going to go pretty pear-shaped, but I can help him with Bible projects, and so we're going through this, and he says, well, how tall is he? And I said, well, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say. And so he says, what you would expect from someone of that generation, I'll Google it. I'm like, you can't Google it. I go, the Google doesn't know because the Bible doesn't tell us. And then he says, well, Google says he's 4'10". So I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if that's canon. But often, all of us, when we have difficulties, we try to solve the problems. Literally, we often Google it. But what does it mean for us to actually turn to God? What would that look like? So let's dive in, in deeper and look at the kind of meditation we should pursue. So understand, Christian meditation is the practice of thinking deeply about a biblical truth to see with clarity in a world made dark and distorted by sin, so that's light, and to warm our affections for Christ by growing our faith, love, and worship for him. This is heat. Make sense? So I'm meditating so that I can see clearer and I can love more. So first, to see with clarity in a work world made dark and distorted by sin. Remember that sin distorts the truth. And so when we meditate on the wrong things, it distorts reality. What this means is that in those moments of suffering or temptation to sin, we need to meditate on biblical truth to rightly understand the world that we live in. Because it doesn't really matter if we know or even believe a truth. If that truth is, act, is not actually shaping the reality of the world we live in, then that truth is fairly useless. Think of the example of God's love. I can say, I fully believe God loves me. I'm convinced of it. I would never deny it. I can tell you verse, verse after verse that proves it to be true. I can offer you examples from my life that attest to his love. And yet, there are times that I don't live in that reality. Because if you think about it, God's love means that he is watching, caring, active, moving, protecting, working, transforming, all for my good. <clears throat> that really means I should never worry. I should never be fearful. I should never get discouraged among a, a plethora of other things. And yet, because I meditate too much in the world, and not enough on Christ. I worry about what is happening. I fear for the future. I get discouraged over the difficulties of life. Do you see the picture? I'm not seeing reality. I'm wandering through life as if I don't live every single moment under the sovereign kindness of a God who loves me far beyond what I could possibly imagine. So I need to, I need to meditate so that I have light. And second, meditation not only offers clarity, but second in your notes, it's, it warms our affections for Christ. So that's heat by growing our faith, love, and worship for him. So it's important to understand the purpose of meditation isn't just replacing lies with truth. It's, it's not only about, like, thinking rightly. Does that make sense? The world has its own version of that, actually. We want the truths we meditate on to fuel our faith and love and worship of Christ. Okay, so we're not just, like, um, um, so I think it would be helpful to remember the point of meditation, again, isn't simply to know biblical facts, and then we can use those, put those to good use. Think of meditation as about a, a relationship. It's us and God. I'm considering who he is, what he means to me, how he works in this world. Not simply so I can act accordingly, but so I can trust and love deeper. I mean, imagine I said, I really want to know if my wife loves me. That way, 
I can trust she'll buy me a gift for my birthday. She'll help take care of the kids. She won't smother me in my sleep, whatever. That's not a good relationship because love is more about knowing facts and then living in light of those facts. The hope of a good relationship is that we grow deeper in love with one another, and the same is true for God. We shouldn't see biblical truth as abstract ideas that we consider what they mean and how they apply. Like, well, God loves me. I guess he's trustworthy. My life will turn out okay. No, truths are fuel for our love for him, our our affections for him. The more I know him, the more I should love him. Think of the previous message and the importance of worship. Meditation helps us to pursue a better savior. Does that make sense? So now we'll continue to get practical, but before we move on, in your notes you have Philippians 4. I would take a look at Philippians 4, 6 through 8 when you have a chance. I don't have time to go through it, but I think it's a great example of the idea of meditation because often we tell people, hey, do not be anxious, like it says in verse 6, and they respond, well, I did pray, but I don't have the peace that transcends understanding, but it's often because we forget verse 8. Right, verse 8 says, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. See what's happening? I mean, it's in the passage on anxiety saying, this is what you need to think about. In other words, we need to encourage them rather than meditate on their sufferings, they need to meditate on their Savior. A couple of quick, a, a couple of more, a, a couple more quick things before we take a practical look at meditation. First, where do we find truth to meditate on? The answer is obviously the Word. But importantly, realize that the truths of Scripture aren't just found in your personal studies of the Bible. Think theologically rich worship songs. Think solid, biblically-based book. I think sermons are a great source of medita- meditation. I, in fact, I think a lot is lost in preaching when people don't meditate on it. <clears throat> so something we have, like we have our counselors, or those we're counseling, meditate on sermons. And one of our members of our church writes something they call Sunday Fuel after every Sunday sermon for the church to look at, to remind themselves, and to reflect on the message. So for example, this last week, Pastor Mark preached on church discipline. So first of all, if you're new to the church, realize it's a grace to sit under faithful men who preach the word. Like maybe you think that's everywhere, and it is not everywhere. But maybe when you heard, you heard, okay, church discipline, you thought, okay, first of all, I don't want to be disciplined, and second of all, if the elders have to do it, then we'll support them. But actually, if you slow down, it was more than that. And one of the things that struck me that he said was how this, this, this calling someone to repentance, to change, is this act of love. Man, that is a good source of meditation, right? Because have you ever thought, oh, I should, I need to confront someone. I need to challenge someone, but what happens? Misdirected meditation. They might get mad at me, or who am I to say anything? I'm, I'm a sinner, or what if we aren't friends anymore, and so on. And in that misdirected meditation, you don't help them. But what if instead you meditate on the sermon? This is how I love them. This is how I minister. This is how I show that I'm really their friend. This is how I display the character of God. This is absolutely for their good. Like if you're meditating on that, wouldn't that change things? So you meditate on the truths of the sermon and 1 Corinthians 5 to encourage you to do what is right. So I hope that makes sense. So, so again, it's, it's, it's the Bible, but it's also sermons and good books and things like that. Second, um, we focus on the truths of Scripture, but when do we meditate? <clears throat> I would say during your personal devotions and during the rest of the day. Okay, so all the time. Um, so kind of think of it as your time with the Lord. That's where it starts, but you need to carry those truths to continue meditation. Now, answering those questions are easy, but now's the question of How? Because even if you're with me to this point, and I say, okay, now go meditate for 10, 10 minutes a day, you may still be thinking, okay, I still don't know what that really means. Um, now, on one hand, I do think meditation improves with practice, so I don't give up right away. But it's very important to understand that meditation isn't just for those who are wired that way, like those who are contemplative, which I'm not, it's, uh, or for those who are really mature, or those with a seminary degree. Think of it as meditation is for everyone in this room. Um, in fact, rather than think of meditation being for the mature, think of meditation as how we mature. So two ideas that we can, um, how we can use meditation to connect truth with everyday life, and then how we can use meditation to go to truth within everyday life. So A in your notes, so first, how do you connect truth with everyday life? Understand meditation is less uh, complicated than you, than you might imagine. When it comes to meditation, it's often simply the idea of slowing down and thinking deeply through biblical truth by turning it over and over in our minds to consider the many implications it has about God, uh, exaltation, ourselves, examination, and the world, expectation. Now, we can't stay here, but in your notes, I have included even more questions for each of these ideas, but the point isn't to overwhelm you, but to give you a starting point. So imagine you hear something on the love of God, and you begin to ask those questions. 
How does God's love speak to my fear, anger, worry, etc.? How does God's love show <coughs> that he's faithful with what I'm going through right now? And the hope would be that you could really connect that truth with what you're going through, with everyday life. Maybe, we'll help, uh, maybe what will help clarify this is, is an example. So for me, in light of some of my health challenges, ministry challenges, life challenges, a verse that I've come back to a lot is 2 Corinthians 12:7. Paul writes, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh. So I begin to meditate on that. I mean, I, I, like really just thinking through it, just slowing down. Um, and again, I'm just trying to connect the truth with my everyday life. And there's a lot there, but one of the things I really zeroed in on was that phrase, to keep me from becoming. That's what Paul writes, to keep me from becoming. Right? He says, to keep me from becoming conceited. So the term conceited has the idea of to exalt oneself. So don't think of bragging as much as like thinking too highly of yourself. It's pride, it's self-dependence, self-focus, self-reliance, self-centeredness. So for Paul, there was this danger of becoming something he was not meant to be, of becoming prideful and dependent. So what does, what does this say about God and, and myself? That God in love gives us thorns to keep us from becoming what could ruin us. And for me, I began to just really focus on that idea, to keep me from becoming so when I would go through some struggle and was tempted to meditate on the world, I would just instead start to meditate on that truth. And for me, it became this conversation with God. And so, so much of my meditation is kind of thinking as I pray. <clears throat> there are conversations where God speaks to me through his word and I respond in prayer. So I might face some challenge and then meditate through prayer like this. Lord, this challenge is you keeping me from becoming. Like, thank you that you love me enough not to let me go further down that path of pride. Lord, protect me from danger, mostly the danger of the sin of my own heart. And Lord, as you keep me from, my, from becoming prideful, help me to be humble. Help me to trust you. Help me to depend on you. Help me to, to know my need for you. Help me to see my hope is in you. Do you see the picture? I'm just taking one idea to keep me from becoming and thinking through it and turning it over and over in my heart through prayer, trying to consider what it says about God, what it says about myself, what it says about the world that I live in so that it would move me to greater faith and worship. Now, we'll look at more um, examples as we go, but B in your notes, <clears throat> how do we then go to the truth in everyday life? So to help this, let me show you something I do for myself and something I encourage those I counsel to do. And the origin of the idea came when I was studying counseling. And what they would do is they would encourage us to come up with um, note cards with Bible verses on them. So that tells you how long I studied um, Bible counseling because they, I don't know if they don't use note cards anymore. But it was great. So if you wanted someone to remember truth, you'd have them write down a, a verse and they were supposed to go to that truth when things were difficult. And it could be helpful, but there were a couple of downsides. One is it became almost mantra, like you just read it over and over and over. And second, it wasn't always to connect that truth to everyday life. So they might be suffering, they might read a verse on God's sovereignty, and then think, well, it's great that God's in control, but how does that help me when I'm struggling to love that person who really hurt me? So we expanded on the note card idea a bit. My wife calls them note cards 2.0. But most often people keep it, and most often people look on their phones. So I literally have places on my phone where I have some of these notes. <clears throat> but they have three ideas. Fact, this is the verse or passage we're gonna consider. Focus, the key truth we wanna focus on. And fuel, like just some memorable, meaningful summary to meditate on when faced with sin or suffering. This is kinda like um, the spark and fuel for a meditation. So let's look at an example. Now, I grew up in the church, so though I have heard about God's love my whole life, I've even preached on it, it wasn't until I slowed down and meditated on it that I really started to appreciate its significance. Specifically, I was, I was going through Romans 8, 38 and 39, <clears throat> for I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's my fact. That's my Bible verse. But as I thought through and meditated on the passage, what specifically struck me was the idea that if absolutely nothing can separate me from the love of Christ, then God is always loving me. Okay, it's not earth shattering. <laughs> Sounds like Christianity 101. But this also means that whatever I'm experiencing is God's love. In other words, nothing can pass into my life that hasn't first passed through the filter of God's love. Not just the joys and the comforts and the encouragements, but the challenges and the sufferings and the trials. They are God loving me. And that became my focus. Nothing passed in my life that hasn't first passed through the filter of God's love. Everything that happens is God loving me. 
And from there, I wanted to come up with my fuel. By that, I simply mean something that is both memorable and meaningful, and will become kind of that spark and fuel for meditation. And this is what I think about, um, so this is what I think about to draw my mind to Scripture, but also connect that truth with what I'm going through. And so for me, my fuel was this. Lord, this difficulty, this suffering, is you loving me? Make sense? So let me flesh it out with, with uh, sharing a, how this impacted my life. It wasn't recently, it was years ago, but it was when I first really kind of remember considering this. But there was a situation, and I was struggling to love a guy in our church. He had offered some very harsh criticism. The quote I will always remember was, your preaching is killing the church. So I didn't have like high aspirations for my preaching, but I'm not hoping for the death of our people, right? So needless to say, that was not exactly what I needed to hear. At the time, we were a, very, a pretty small church. Preaching had always been a struggle, like I shared. And so I would question, like, should I even be preaching? So I struggled to love. And in that, I began the misdirected meditation. I would find my, my, wine, my mind wandering, and I would have this almost courtroom scene in my, my head, me against them. Needless to say, I always came out righteous. I'm sure many of you have kind of rehearsed those in your head. I would think about what he said. I would question, <clears throat> I would question his character. Sometimes I worry about maybe he's right. Maybe I am killing the church. I would often think of, of that person, especially when I was doing my, my message prep, and my mind would kind of wander down angry and bitter and discouraged past, and this is all again because of my misdirected meditation. Now, in all this, should it be shocking that I was anxious and I was fearful and I was bitter, that I was struggling to love? I was doing daily devotions in bitterness, and I wasn't meditating on the gospel. I wasn't thinking of my own sin, of which there was, it was clearly there. I wasn't thinking much of Christ, and subsequently, I wasn't loving much. Now, in the past, if you'd asked me what to do with criticism of our preaching, I would have said the humble thing to do is to think, even if they're only 5% right, then take that 5% and learn from it and throw out the rest, right? Sounds like a pretty godly answer, right? But to be honest, that did nothing to encourage my heart when I was criticized. And what I started to realize was the implication of that was that God has a 5% loving purpose in that criticism. But let's believe that God has a 100% loving purpose in criticism, that is even only 5% right. Remember, nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. So that wasn't a 5% love situation. Meaning the better way to view it was to take the 5% and let my preaching be changed, and the 95% and let my heart be changed. In other words, yeah, grow as a minister from that 5% of criticism that's true, and everything else that seemed untrue and undeserved and hurtful, let God use that to transform my heart. Because be assured, God doesn't ordain moments with 5% purpose. They're always 100% purpose, always 100% love. So for me, change happened when I began to focus on that truth. This person was God loving me. All right, nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. And that person is God loving me. He was loving me by revealing my sin and my areas of growth. Ultimately, he was rescuing me from my pride. So when I was tempted to meditate on the wrong things, I would, be, <clears throat> I would meditate and pray something like this. God, this person is you loving me. There can be another way around it. If it was more loving for me not to have them in life, I wouldn't, because you're constantly loving me. Lord, I can't understand exactly what you're doing, but I know it's in love. I'm sure you're doing something great in me. I trust that in love, you're freeing me from my idols and drawing me to yourself. In love, you're rescuing me from my sin and showing that you're infinitely greater. In love, you're compromising shallow happiness for greater holiness to bring me deeper joy. Lord, I believe that because you love me, you will make everything right. If not in this world, then on the other side of eternity. Lord, thank you for loving me, not just more than I love myself, but better than I love myself. I, I confess I so easily want comfort and happiness, but you want so much more for me. And in your sovereign love, you pursue for me what too often I do not pursue for myself, a deeper relationship with you. So Lord, thank you for your love. I do not deserve it. And so when I was 10, that, I was doing that all the time. Like, I would, I, would, I would, he would come to mind. I was tempted to think about the wrong things. And then I would meditate on that truth. That person was in my church because God loves me so passionately. He has so much bigger hopes for me than I have for myself. And again, rarely was this during quiet times, right? It was when I was driving. It was at church when I'm studying. And God used that to change me. Now, we're almost out of time. So, um, but let me crystallize it some more. Let me give you uh, just one other example from my own life and how meditation has encouraged me. Um, and I hope it will illustrate it, but I hope it show it's not that complicated. In other words, if, if I can do it, you can do it. But let me share about my health problems. And I don't, I don't enjoy sharing about this. Like if you have church, like I, 
I don't talk about that often at my church, actually. I don't really mention it. I mean, people know what's going on, but um, and that being said, I'm sure some of you have worse health problems than me, uh, but since this is where I need a meditation, this is what I'm going to share. So again, I had, I had heart surgery. The healing hasn't gone as quickly as hoped. In fact, in a little over a week, I have to have another surgery uh, to kind of try to correct the rhythm, and we'll, we'll hopefully that'll help. But very noticeably, like I mentioned, my sternum didn't heal. And particularly one way that I, would, I knew that it wasn't healing was that there was a cracking in my chest. So almost imagine a knuckle cracking. And so periodically through the day, I would do something I probably wasn't supposed to, and it would crack, right? Um, so that's pretty awesome, let me tell you. And with this, as well as various other challenges, there was this temptation, obviously, to worry and to become frustrated, right? I hated that I was a burden on my wife. I, I hated that I couldn't play catch with my youngest son or play volleyball with the older ones. I, I worried, um, I was worried about more surgeries. I was, I, things were like, will, will I ever heal? Is this the rest of my life? What if there's something more serious going wrong? And you can imagine, there is a lot of fuel for misdirected meditation. So I did try to guard against this. Like one thing, I refused to do deep internet searches on my heart condition. Like they would tell me, okay, there's a surgery coming. I'm like, I could look that up, but I have a feeling I don't really want to know. You know, so I would maybe talk to a doctor at my church and that's, that was good enough for me. But I was trying to guard my heart against letting my mind wander. But on the other hand, I was constantly fighting to meditate on biblical truth. <coughs> because honestly, every time I didn't feel well, every time I, visited the, I would visit the doctors, every time my chest cracked, I was tempted to meditate on the wrong things. Like sometimes, because of some previous issues, I was like worried that I was dying. So imagine, I, that would happen when I was preaching sometimes. Like, oh man, I really don't feel good. Am I, am I gonna die right here? Now let me tell you what tells you something about me and my sense of humor and how much I, I, I'm committed to preaching. I did, this would cross my mind when that happened. That will be the greatest sermon illustration ever. Because if I say like, hey, you gotta love God and then I die, then everyone's gonna remember that I said you gotta love God. Okay, so that's its own discussion. So let me offer some examples of things that I did to meditate. And I can't go through all these, but, um, but notice that they're biblical, but I came upon them in different ways. So one time I was listening to a sermon, I'm doing laundry, I'm listening to a sermon, and a pastor mentions a quote from Paul Tripp's New Morning Ministry, Mer- New Morning Mercies. So I look it up, and I consider it. And Tripp, Tripp writes this about how God used the tragedy of the cross to bring the triumphs of salvation. He says the very worst thing that could happen was at the very same, same time the very best thing that could happen. Only God is able to do such things. The same God who planned that your worst thing would be the best thing is your father. And that was like gospel truth I needed to meditate on. And it was funny because in our counseling class in the previous week, I'd used that exact same truth as an example of how God can use difficulties and suffering to accomplish a greater good, and yet I hadn't even applied it to my own life. So I thought about Acts 23 and 24. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. It was God's plan, we murder, he raises up, salvation won. Amazing, right? So I meditated on that, that God can use tragedy for triumph. So the focus was that God can use the greatest sin, if God can use the greatest sin and suffering, I'm sorry, the focus was that God can use the greatest sin and suffering to accomplish the greatest good. And my feel was this, my worst days are my best days. My hard days are my hopeful days. And I would just, I would remind myself of that when something wasn't going well. So again, if if I started not to feel well, my mind began to race on what could potentially be the problem, and then I would just consider that, that truth. Like, Lord, my hard days are my hopeful days. Like, this is kindness. This is you working. This is you protecting. This is you loving. And as I meditate on that, my heart would go from racing to resting. Or about this one, I'd mentioned Matthew 6, 24, just kind of as a side in my preaching. But I slowed down to think about it. So this is the fact, Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will love the one and <clears throat> he will hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. And I focused on the first part of that, med- that verse and meditated, no one can have two masters. So I start to meditate, but, but I want to. I, I want Jesus, but I also want good health and good circumstances and blessings. But it says no one, because it says if we try, I will hate God and despise God. But then I think, I would never hate God. So I continue to meditate. And I can start to consider what it means to have another master, another one that I love and I'm devoted to. And I realize that what it means is that not only do I, I make other things like health an idol, I actually ask God to help me get it. In other words, I don't, I don't really want God in those moments. I want his blessings. It's almost like, I'm, Lord, would you get me my idol? Would you give me something else to worship to? 
what the passage says, and I come back to it. No one can have two masters. I start thinking, about, be, how foolish it would be to tell my wife, hey, I love another woman, but I don't hate you. I don't despise you. I just love someone else. And so through meditation, I had to humbly admit that too often I try to have two masters, and I'm unable to. So I can't make health my master. But what I really look for, for my hope, my hope and my happiness so that was my focus. We can only worship God or an idol, never both. And I feel the idea that I meditated on was this, getting healthy may be a gift, but it can never be a God. And so I would pray along those lines, Lord, I want to be healthy, but health isn't my God. You are. You are the one I love. You are the one I trust. You're the one I need. And when I could get my hand, when I meditate on those ideas, it would, it would again bring me peace. Okay, one more, and we'll close with this. I was reading through the book that we were going through at the time for our small groups. It was on the Lord's Prayer by Kevin DeYoung. And he pointed out in the section on give us this day our daily bread from Matthew 6, 11, that our daily bread isn't, phys- isn't just physical, but spiritual. In other words, God will daily give us what we need to not only survive physically, but spiritually. So I meditated on that. Just considering what it means that every single day, God in his kindness gives me exactly what I need spiritually. And so I thought about my own life. And as I wrestled with the idea that he hasn't healed me yet, and I realized that one of my sins that I tend to struggle with is self-reliance. For example, if there's some challenge in ministry, my, minist- my response is almost always work harder. Not pray harder, not trust more, not, but, but work harder. And so I can assure you the moment I am healthy, I will be very tempted to simply become my old self-reliant self. I will not live humbly, I will not live prayerfully, I will not live dependently. And so I really do believe that my slow healing is God's way to remind me to be humble and prayerful and dependent. So my focus was, God will daily give us what we need, physically and spiritually. And my field then became this. <clears throat> this trial or suffering is my daily bread. And so sometimes I would, I would just be walking and my chest would crack and my mind would want to go, right? And then I'd remind myself that, Lord, this cracking in my chest, that's my daily bread. This is what I need in this moment to be more prayerful, more dependent, more humble. Because right now, I'm, we're praying, I'm praying to you. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm pleading to you, and that is your grace to me. Beyond the cracking, while my heart, uh, while they kind of got my heart initially beating in rhythm, they also told me it would revert, or could revert, which it does, uh, to, to <clears throat> into lack of rhythm. And that was discouraging, because I was hoping, well, they'll fix it, and then I'll, uh, I won't have to worry about it again. But in reality, it meant that every day I would have to pray and ask God that he would keep my heart in rhythm. So that danger, if you will, of my heart going back into into a bad rhythm, it was my daily bread. I mean, imagine, rather than simply just get healthy, move on with my own prideful, self-sufficient life, I have to constantly pray and live dependently knowing that every beat of my heart is in his hands. Like, most of us don't think along those lines, right? Because it just goes. All right, we need to close, but hopefully you see the big picture of it all. We have to guard our hearts from misdirected meditation and pursue Christ through biblical meditation. And you know, as I put, I think, a lot of examples of how this has looked in my life or in the lives of those I counsel, hopefully it can offer you some fuel for your meditation. But will you take a moment and pray with me? Dearly Father, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, we confess so easily we set our mind on things of earth. I'm sure some here, even this evening, they, they feel that the heaviness that they've thought so often of the sins of their spouse, or they've meditated so often on lustful images, or they've meditated so often on some idea of success or, or victory. But Lord, in setting our mind on things of earth, we give life what is earthly in us. So Lord, help us to set our mind on things above. Help us to live each moment fighting to think of you and to see our life in light of you and your grace. Lord, help us to know that it will transform us for our good and for your glory. We thank you, we love you, we praise you, and pray this in Jesus' name, amen.